اعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فوض امري الى الله ان الله بصير بالعباد ولا حول ولا قوة الا بالله العلي العظيم حسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل ونعم المولى ونعم النصير والصلاة والسلام والتحية والإكرام على الرسول المسدد المصطفى الأمجد المحمود الأحمد الذي سمي في السماء بأحمد وفي الأرض بأب القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين المنتجبين الذين أذهب الله أنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وقل رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقه قولي اما بعد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتاب الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقال ربكم ادعوني استجب لكم صدق الله العلي العظيم my respected elders brothers and sisters around the globe سلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته question what is the power of prayer in one's life Keep that question in the back of your mind, inshallah, we'll return to it. We've covered a substantial amount of ground in the past several days and nights, and we've been talking about Islam in a modern society, philosophy, ethics, and spirituality. The idea being that the Islamic philosophy of how to think clearly, how to think proper, how to implement proper Islamic thinking in our lives, which leads to a framework of actually adopting Islamic ethics and ethical values in our life, which ultimately leads us to our end goal, which we're all striving for, which is that of spirituality. And in the previous nights, we took case study examples of, for, of for marriage, for example, and how that can be seen of understanding the Islamic philosophy of marriage. And we said how that is a, a framework where someone comes forward and says that this is a sign amongst the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, marriage that is. And then the next level of that was, we said that there are ethical traits that one should adopt such as humility, such as generosity in terms of words and kindness and the likes and gratitude. And all of these things lead to fulfillment of the heart and benefit. And ultimately, we said that the goal for the husband and wife should be taqwa to get closer to Allah. Therefore, spirituality within the Islamic context is God consciousness. The more our hearts, the more our minds, the more that our existence is mindful, conscious, of the existence of God, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, number one. Number two, his role in our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. The more one will be inclined towards spirituality. Spirituality is found in constantly remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at every moment in time. Now that doesn't mean that one evades or goes away from their daily responsibilities of working, of earning a livelihood, of studying, of doing whatever you are doing. It doesn't mean that you, uh, you abandon that, not at all. What it means is whatever I'm doing in my life, what, whether it's work, whether it's school or anything, just being with my family, I'm remembering and connecting that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm connecting that to my Lord. Then I'm being grateful to my Lord for the ability to be able to work, for example, for the ability, for example, to be able to study and learn, for example, for, and grateful for the ability of being with family and loved ones or whatever I'm grateful for. I take the time to connect that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I take the time to connect whatever I'm doing in my life to my Lord, to my creator. That's really the essence of the framework of spirituality. And therefore, one of the most important, one of the most valuable, one of the most powerful traits in the toolkit of the spiritual mystic or the wayfarer on the path of God is that of having spirituality and supplication, dua. Supplication, prayer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one of the greatest forms of gifts that God, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you and I to help us in the most difficult of times, to have a connection with Him. And this is what I want to look at. How does the person who is on the path of spirituality use the du'as, the supplications that we have in our repertoire as followers of the Ahlul Bayt, from the du'as of the Ahlul Bayt, as well as du'as that are personal between us and Allah, that only Allah knows and no one else knows. How do we use these tools that Allah has given us in order that in our lives we can have more more tranquil lives, more peaceful lives, and ultimately just better lives. And not only that, 
a better hereafter more importantly. So number one, what do I want to look at in our analysis? The first stage I want to look at is, is prayer, is supplication, is dua only for our school of thought or have other schools of thought and other religions around the globe comment on, commented on it? And what is their worldview on this matter? Then I want to come at the Islamic view. What does Islam say with respect to dua and prayer? And then I want to look at, is there any benefit in our lives for prayer from the scientific angle? Is research coming forward and telling us any benefits that prayer can actually have in our lives? And you'll find that the research is quite surprising on this. And I'll ultimately con conclude with how this all ties in with us as individuals going on the path of spirituality so that we can have more contentment, peace, tranquility in our lives and less materialism, less worry and concern about material aspects and ultimately get closer to our Lord and Creator. Therefore, point number one, have other religions, have other faiths on this planet looked at the institution of supplication? Have they looked at ibadah or worship in particular? I'm talking about prayer and supplication to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Judaism, you find it's very clear that there is a long tradition of supplication within the Judaic faith of the Abrahamic faiths, where there is the Psalms, which is called sort of uh, a book of prayer. In fact, our Sahifa Sajadiyah, which is known as the Psalms or Zawbur Ali Muhammad. There are also these different prayers that you will find within Judaic texts. And the idea within Judaism is that one should have a relationship where they are in constant communication with their Lord. In fact, the Jewish community has three times a day which they are supposed to pray. And they have a book of prayer called the Siddur. And that book is where they refer to in order to have prayer towards God, towards, uh, their, uh, towards God. Number one. Number two. When we come to Christianity, Christianity also has a long tradition of worship, in particular prayer, in particular supplication. In the text of Christianity, you will find three stages of different types of prayer. The first level of prayer in Christianity is that type of prayer which just comes from the lips towards God. That's the first level or the base layer, base level of worship within Christianity of prayer. That is. Number two is where someone begins to reflect to the point that it becomes a meditation. That is the next level. The first is the utterance from the lips. The second is deeper contemplation that leads to meditation. And ultimately, the third level is contemplation itself, where one is thinking at multiple layers. This third la layer, where one is thinking, not, not only reflecting, the difference between the second stage and the third stage is the, that in the second stage, the individual is thinking on a one-dimensional layer, one level. But in the second uh, one that I refer to, the last layer, which is contemplation, the individual is thinking on multiple layers. This is also called intercession within Christianity. And therefore, Christians believe that prayer is a vital part of their faith. And, and within Christianity, prayer can be individual, between the individual and God, and it can also be communal between or, or corporate, it's as it's known in Christianity, or public. It can be one where a group of individuals, an entire congregation gets together and prays towards, uh, towards God. That's within Christianity. Within Islam, indeed, worship has a, in, in the form of dua, ibadah of dua, that is supplication, has an extremely important element within it. I say this, and I, you'll notice me constantly using the term uh, dua, as well as I'm using ibadah, as in worship. This is very unique and interesting because in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so infinitely generous in our belief that he has created dua as a form of ibadah. Reflect on that for a moment. He has made supplication a form of worship. Imagine you and I come forward in the court, in the grand court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we, not only are we told to ask what we want, on top of that, Allah gives us reward for asking. Can you imagine that in any court around the world for that to be true? How odd that would be? How strange that would be? How different that would be? Imagine going, you're living in the Middle Ages, you're living in, 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 uh, in Europe, in the 1500s, and you go to the, the king's court, who's ruling over England, and you say at that moment in time that I want, 
a, a gold house. I want a horse. I want X, Y, and Z. And not only do you expect the person to grant it to you, on top of that, you expect them to think highly of you for asking, for appreciating the fact, appreciating the fact that you're asking. This is the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of God Almighty, where He's not only telling us to ask Him for what we need, on top of that, he's saying, I will reward you. I will give you ajr. I will give you reward for asking. Imagine the amazing generosity of our Lord and our Creator. On top of that, I, be, I want to shed light on the verse that Allah, of the Quran that I recited at the beginning. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah 40, chap, in, uh, chapter 40, verse 60, he says that call unto me, I'll answer. On top of that, there's form of prayer that Ahlul Bayt Ali Musalam have told us. According to Imam Al Baqir Ali Salam, it's attributed to the firm that said that Allah is referring to dua in this in particular, that this is a form of worship and of ibadah. On top of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one verse or one place in the Quran where Allah moves away from his, his way of speaking that is that of grandeur, the one where he is saying, We made this decision. We made this a sign. We, referring to his essence and being, there's one place where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has moved away from this formality of saying that, uh, for example, we did this. Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the, the, the personal way of communication. وَإِذَا بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ وَإِذَا سَعْلَكَ إِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّائِي إِذَا دَعَانِي that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in one place, multiple times, He uses the I, where He says to the Holy Prophet, He says that when my servant asks you about me, tell him that I am near. I answer the dua, the supplication of the one who supplicates when he supplicates towards me. Allahu Akbar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that, that grand Lord, that grand creator is now inviting you and I to pray towards him with such a level of mercy that he has removed all formalities and, sa and said, when you ask and you call on me, I will answer you. What is this generosity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It is a tribute that Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam was asked that when we ask, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, when we ask Allah for what we want, when we ask him for uh, uh, things, should we ask him for the akhirah only? Or should we ask him also for what we want in this dunya, in this world? Should we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also for, for example, if I want a good job? Should I ask Allah if I want to get admission into a great university? Should I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if I want, uh, for example, I want some type of peace of mind and tranquility in this world? Whatever it may be, should I ask for worldly things? Or should I ask for things for the hereafter only? Can I ask for worldly things? It's a fair question that comes to the mind of many people. And the Imam Ali Musalam gives a surprising and beautiful answer. He says that ask and ask Allah even for worldly things. Because Allah has opened and left his door of mercy and asking open. That when you ask him, you're still remembering him. And that's really the essence of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is allowing us to do to allow us to remember him. And through that grace of remembering him, he even welcomes asking for world things. So the Imam says, even ask for that. Now the etiquette of asking is that one not only ask for what I want in this world, but think about what are those things that Allah has asked me to do? So do I ask in addition to my worldly things that I may want, which is fine. I also ask, give me the ability to pray to you adequately or better than I am now. Give me the ability to learn knowledge that allows me to get closer to you, my Lord, my creator. Give me the ability to deal with people in such a manner that I'm reminded of you or I get closer and more connected to you. What's an example of that? Well, maybe somebody wants to endeavor in nonprofit, in charity, in helping the world make, a, make the world a better place. That may be a way to actually connect with God, to connect with Allah through his creation. I say this because we sometimes don't realize how powerful dua is for our daily lives. And science comes forward on this respect. By the way, we think that prayer is something that only we may hold near and dear. 
in studies such as a Pew Research study that was conducted in 2013, it was found that over half of Americans believed that prayer was an important part of life. Uh, beyond that, 75% of Americans said prayer was an important part of daily life. So over half admitted to praying. And then on top of that, 75% said they believed that prayer was an important part of daily life. In fact, some studies have suggested that even atheists or people who don't affiliate with any religion formally, they even admit in their privacy to praying to something at some point in time, to God or some being or some entity whenever they are in that time, in that moment. Yet we as human beings should try to develop a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in those moments and in those times of ease as well as hardship. The Ahlul Bayt salam in Mizanul Hikmah that I was reciting and that I was reading earlier, the Ahlul Bayt have told us and suggested to us that we should develop a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the good times so that we, He is not a foreigner to us in the bad times. So we are not unacquainted with Him in the bad times and the difficult times. The, the research and the analysis of Will and Ariel Durant. These were two husband, this was a husband and wife, Will and Ariel, uh, Will Durant and Ariel Durant. They were both philosophers and historians. They wrote several books together. The magnum opus or one of the biggest works that they wrote together, the most important works that they wrote together was The Lessons of History by Will and Ariel Durant. It's a very favorite book of many people on Wall Street and many other people who have material success in a lot of ways. And when asked, what is the history of religion and humanity summed up into one line? If you take all of the history of humanity and its relationship to religion, what is the conclusion that you get? And they said, that's simple. That's very straightforward. And, and when asked, they said, what is it? They said, the history of humanity is summed up with respect to religion as the following. That when times are good, religiosity goes down. When times are good, religiosity goes down. And when times are bad, religiosity goes up. The Quran beautifully captures the sentiment when it says with respect to human beings that they ask when they are at the seas and their ship, their ship is sinking, they ask for help and assistance. And when Allah delivers them towards the shore and to safety, they forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if they had no assistance and help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How negligent are we as men? How negligent is mankind that we don't reflect on the beauty and the grandeur of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our lives. Research suggests with respect to prayer, with respect to supplication, one of the things that dua, supplication can help us in our lives in this dunya is very powerful, is researchers suggest that when we do dua, when we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we pray from our belief system, when one prays, it actually strengthens the point, it strengthens the muscle of an individual with respect to self-discipline. What do I mean about self-discipline and the muscle of self-discipline? Researchers argue that self-discipline, for example, the discipline that you need for work, for school, for achieving your business goals, for achieving whatever you want in life, that requires discipline. And as one does more and more, you get tired and you get fatigued. One way that you can strengthen yourself, one way that you can revive yourself in terms of your strength is by praying. What did researchers do? What researchers did at that very moment was they asked people to do strenuous tasks, things that they're, not, they're, they're getting fatigued by. And they asked one control group to just do what they normally do in terms of tasks, for example, writing, for example, reading, things that were difficult uh, in the long term. The second group, that was the control group. The second group, they asked them, before you do this strenuous task, before you do this difficult task, stop, pause, and reflect for a moment and say a prayer. When they told the second group to do a prayer, they found that the second group that prayed before they came forward and uh, did their task, they actually were able to get through the fatigue and they were actually able to do more. The point that I'm driving at here is worship and prayer can be a very powerful tool to get us through fatigue. So just try to implement that in our lives. But how? By stopping and pausing and before you do something difficult, whether it's work, whether it's school, whether it's a 
maybe even a, a, a discussion with your spouse that may not be going the right way. Pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say a prayer that, Ya Allah, allow this business deal or this work to go well. My Lord, my Creator, allow this studies that I'm endeavoring in, allow this to allow me to excel in this and allow me to connect this to you. And all of this cognizance and mindfulness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ultimately allows us to get closer to Him. And that's really the essence of spirituality. That's the root of spirituality. That's the actual kernel of spirituality. The kernel of the kernel. God consciousness, mindfulness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I share these studies. I share this framework that I try to share with my, uh, with my friends here who are viewing because I believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all roads ultimately lead to my Lord and my Creator and our Lord and our Creator. It's just how cognizant we are of it. How mindful are we of it? Many times we fall into a state of ghafla, a state of being negligent or unmindful or heedless of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Spirituality, the root of spirituality is just that. Not being in a state of ghafla, not being in a state of ghafil of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and rather being mindful, cognizant of my Lord and of my Creator. And on top of that, studies find that people who pray, and this is so important for our world today, people who pray are genuinely nicer, according to studies. Research has shown that people who pray on a regular basis, according to surveys, are found to be nicer individuals. I say this because we still live in a world where unfortunately there's fear and there's trepidation. Every day we're hearing about individuals being killed innocently many a times. And you know that at some point in time, and I'm talking about generally what's happening in the news in our world globally, innocent people being killed and fights that are ensuing from different parties and different factions. Being kind, being nice, being compassionate is one tool that will give you tremendous value in this world and in the akhirah and in the world beyond this. The next level that I want to discuss with respect to Islam is the benefits that dua gives in terms of congregational dua. Dua that is done in a communal form with multiple people. I mentioned Christianity has this form of dua and supplication as well. In Islam, the concept of communal dua, dua as a congregation and a group is very powerful. And keep this in mind, especially in the environment that we're going in with COVID-19 and others, Think about doing dua for the whole world, for our entire society. How valuable, how, how noteworthy is that? So we can pray for humanity. You know, we as Muslims, we have a responsibility, as I've alluded to in past lectures, not only to our own families and our own communities. We have a responsibility to our societies. We have a responsibility to humanity to make this world a better place with our presence and our existence. There's a moment in time that a man by... Ibn Umar al-Bajali, it's attributed, he came to Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam and he said, Yabna Rasulillah, I'm in a very difficult position financially. I'm suffering financially and I don't have any income and I need help. And this was someone from Kufa. He had come from Kufa towards Medina where the Imam alayhi salam was. The Imam alayhi salam, as you know, he was busy with his with his, with his teachings and he was writings and his supplications and his du'as. The Imam Ali Muslim but always took out time to help people. And when this person asked, I need help financially, the Imam could have very easily given him some income as the Imam and their generosity it was limitless as I've shared in numerous traditions uh, in pre previous nights. But the Imam Ali Muslim perhaps was giving him a lesson that was more valuable at this point than any other. You know, the idea that you give a man a fish, feed him for a day, and you teach him how to fish, you teach him for life. The Imam was teaching him a principle here. The Imam Ali Musalam said, I want you to do something. He said, what, Ibn Rasulullah? Ibn Umar al-Bajali says. He says, I want you to go back to Kufa. And when you go back to Kufa, get a group of your friends, of mu'mineen, of brethren, of your faith, get them together, and I want you to feed them, give them food. At that point in time, the man's probably thinking in his mind, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, I don't have any money. I came here to tell you I don't have any income. I don't have any money. You're telling me to go feed people? The Imam didn't stop there. He said, even Hafs ibn Umar al-Bajali, he says, even if you have to go and sell the pillow you sleep on, sell that pillow and feed these brethren. 
And when you feed them, ask them to do dua for you. Ask them to pray for you. Ask them to supplicate for you. Hafs ibn Umar al-Bajali had God consciousness, taqwa, piety, and he respected and he understood the position of the imam. He understood this is also a form of spirituality because the imam gets us closer and gives us a fast track, an expressway to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by teaching us the method of supplicating and actually being conscious of Allah. So Hafs said very well, the imam has said so, I will follow through. He says, I got back to Kufa. When I got back to Kufa, I, was, I wasn't able to get any income or anything. And so finally, I decided to do what the imam told me. And that was to sell my pillow so I would have some income. So I went to the market. I sold my pillow. When I was able to sell my pillow, I then went and got some ingredients, some groceries in order to be able to cook a meal for these individuals. He says, I cooked a meal for these individuals and I invited my friends, my brethren. And when I invited them, I asked them, to eat and enjoy this blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at the end, if you could, please make dua, please make a supplication, please pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase my sustenance. When he did this, having trust in the word of the Imam and having trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he did this, at that point in time, the tradition tells us that he says, when the guests dispersed, the next day he heard a knock on the door. When he heard a knock on the door, he opened the door. Salamu alaikum wa alaikum as salam. When this ensued, he noticed it was an old friend, an old friend of his. When he noticed it was an old friend of his who had, he had done business with some time ago, he greeted him and he invited him in. And he says, How can I help you? He said that, you know, you remember that there was a debt, the guest said, You remember there was a debt that I owed you? I owed you some money. We had done a business deal. He said, Yes, actually, come to think of it, I remember. He said, that I have come to repay that debt and clear that debt with you. Therefore, he said, I put, he put a bag onto the table, a sack onto the table, and he said, this is the debt. I thank you for your assistance, and he left. He says, after that, Hafs ibn Umar al-Bajali opens the bag, and he began, began to see it was 10,000 dirham. This was the amount that he was in need of, and this was the debt that had been cleared. He said at that point in time, from that day up until the end of his life, he says, or up until the time of the narration, Hafs ibn Umar al bajr he says, Allah expanded my business to the point that I was no longer in need of anyone's assistance. This was the power of the word of the Imam. The Imam teaching the Hafs ibn Umar and also teaching us what is the way that an individual should pray so that they can get perpetual divine blessings in their lives. You and I can adopt the same thing. How? By actually implementing a, a sense of God consciousness in ourselves and our brethren and our sisters. For the sisters, the same principle applies. Invite others. Invite, maybe give them a gift in the way of food or otherwise and ask them to do dua for you. You will notice that the blessings of Allah will descend in your life, inshallah. The same thing. In our world today, if we're not able to interact with people directly today at this moment in time, well, maybe have a Zoom call. Maybe have a a call with some friends and ask everyone to do dua for each individual. I know there are people who are hurting, who are in pain in our communities. I've just received news from, from England of friends and their elders and their parents passing away uh, due to COVID-19. This pain is not very hard. Pray for those who are ill and pray for those who have lost loved ones. And by virtue of this, inshallah, Allah will not only give blessings in their lives, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you blessings in your lives. And don't forget what I said at the onset. The blessing of dua in Allah, in Islam, is such a great blessing by Allah that He not only counts it in terms of giving you what you want, maybe now, maybe delaying it till later, or maybe in the hereafter, if He doesn't do one of these three, He will at least, not, if nothing else, give you the reward of asking Him. This is what is called a win-win situation if there ever was one. You have nothing to lose. You only have to gain. And that's the principle of life. This is a principle that people who are the most successful in our world from a worldly standpoint, materialistic standpoint, a lesson that may benefit everyone, inshallah, which we'll try to wrap up and conclude on. We think sometimes the successful people, the Bill Gates, the Steve Jobs, the Warren Buffetts of the world, they try to take tremendous risk in order to be successful. That you take a big risk to be successful. Rather, you'll find that they follow something called asymmetric risk reward. What is that? 
that a very little downside and huge upside. That was true for Bill Gates when he started Microsoft. He had nothing to lose, as he says, or very little to lose, but he had a huge upside. Steve Jobs, when he started Apple, he said, well, I had all I had to lose, me and Steve Wozniak, his co-founder, when we were young and starting the company was the shirts off our backs. We had not much to lose, but the upside was huge. Look for asymmetric risk rewards. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt, is giving us the method of learning how to fish that is doing dua, number one. And number two, it's complete asymmetric risk reward where all the benefits are in our favor of supplicating for, to dua, to, doing dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ عُدُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ Chapter 40, verse 60. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where he says, where he uses the informal point that I referred to earlier. He, he drops all the formalities. When he says, وَإِذَا سَعَلَكَ إِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبُ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاءِ إِذَا دَعَانِي فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُ لِي وَلِيُؤْمِنُوا بِي حَلَّهُمْ يُرْشِدُ That's the mercy of our Lord. I answer the supplication of the supplicant when he calls upon me. Allah is speaking to you and I at this point. Don't be heedless. Don't be, don't be so. One of the gifts is that one of the forms of gratitude to Allah is when He gives us a gift, we're mindful of it, and we express that gratitude. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us and bless our lives and allow us to pray to Him, allow us to do dua to Him, allow us to help ourselves and our brethren and our families and our friends through dua and we also ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the kernel of spirituality in our lives by means of dua by means of supplications of the imams through sahifa sajjadiya through the duas for example that are taught to us by our imams such as dua iftitah which we recite in these beautiful nights of shahar ramadan let us reflect let us contemplate on the beautiful words of these duas so that we entrench and fill our hearts with the ma'rifah, with the spirituality and the God consciousness that we all strive for. وَآخِرُ الدَّعْوَانَا أَنِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ